Okay, so my name is Stefano Piemontese, and I am a Marie Curie Research Fellow at the Institute for Research into Superdiversity at the University of Birmingham. And today we have the opportunity to discuss a book that has been published recently in November 2020 uh, by the Bristol University Press. The, the book is Romani Communities and Transformative Change, a New Social Europe. It is open access and is co-edited by Andrew Ryder, Marius Taba and Nidhi Trihan, who are with us today to talk about some of the issues and debates addressed in this, uh, in this collection. So let, we, let me quickly introduce them and say a couple of words about the book before leaving the floor to them. Um, Andrew Ryder is Associate Professor at the Institute of Communication and Sociology at the Corvinus University in Budapest. He's also a social justice campaigner and has been involved in several policy-oriented research projects related to Roma people in the UK, if I'm right. And today he will introduce us to the main concept that is framing and guiding the contribution in this book. So basically, what is social Europe and what is the relevance of uh, this concept to Roma? Marius Taba is the second speaker. He is lecturer in Romani in the Romani Studies program at the National School of Political and Administrative Studies in Bucharest. And he has a long track record of community activism at the local and international level. Um, he has been researcher and um, advocacy manager at the Roma Education Fund, right, for uh, 10 years. And today he will talk about anti-gypsism in a time of neoliberalism and authoritarian populism. And the third speaker is Nidhi Trihan. Nidhi is Affiliated Senior Research Fellow at the Romani Studies Program at the Central European University. She has written widely on human rights, civil society, social movements, with a particular focus on Romani communities in Europe. And today she will present um, on another topic that is recurring in the book, which is Romani organizing and its discontent. So the book unfolds against the backdrop of a very dark, picture, I would say, which is the hostile environment where the leaves of Roma uh, take place in Europe. Uh, so it's the reality of neoliberalism, authoritarian populism, anti-gypsism, austerity before and the pandemic today. So I, some parts of the book, I mean, if you are already um, frustrated, they, they just get your frustration worse. And um, in the beginning, I was like hoping to Say okay, let's see where is the the way forward. Forward, no, where what should we do? No, and somehow these kind of um, um, questions uh, I had in the beginning were answered uh, throughout the book. Um, so moving from this hostile environment, from this uh, dark picture, um, the book does not only provide the conceptual tools for reframing discourses, debates on Romani identity, poverty, and exclusion, but it really brings the reader to the center of crucial debates that revolves around, around this topic. I think can be really interesting for people who, hasn't, who are not familiar with the, with, with, um, with the topic to, to, to use the book as a way to enter, right? These this, uh, this different debates. Um, and the author sort of uh, first present these debates, engage with them, and they really attempt to indicate a way forward. And I think we can identify, or at least I, I sort of identify three sets of debates that are recurring in the book. Uh, we first have the policies, you know, with the evergreen dispute on targeted versus colorblind approaches, the balance between redistribution, recognition, pro and cons of identity politics, universalist approaches, and more recently, the hope that the new strategy, um, the, the new Roma strategy framework will be better than the old one, and maybe match the spirit of the new social Europe. So there is all these kind of sets of debates which is somehow linked to the policies, and I think Andrew will address this in his uh, presentation. Mm, the second set of debates is related to the fact that these policies will be successful only if we tackle the hostile environment for uh, where Roma in Europe live. So issues of anti-gypsism and structure, structural racism emerge as a main angle to look at the relationship between the Roma and non-Roma institutions. 
Um, and then there is a third set of debates which revolves around the multiple nexus between the Romani communities, their allies, the Roman intellectuals, the non-Romani scholars. So there are issues of knowledge production, community organi organizing, and intersectional alliances. Now, I think these are more, this is more or less the kind of uh, map where uh, the, the, the different um, debates of the book can be set and move. Um, so after reading this book, and then I conclude, um, I, was left, I was left with the feeling that this is not only an academic collection, but is, a, uh, is also a manifesto. Uh, because it's really set an agenda and offer, uh, offers a vision uh, for the future. I don't know if I am right. I think so. I will, uh, before leaving the word to the speakers, to Andrew, uh, first, I, will, I would like to ask people to, if they didn't, to mute their mic and um, make this advertisement that basically there is, now I will share with you a, a link if Maybe did uh, Nidhi, you already did it. Okay, good. So there is a 20% of discount on the paperback um, edition. Yeah. Okay, so please, Andrew, the floor, the Zoom is yours for the next 10 minutes. Okay, thank you, Stefano, for, for those comments. I just want to give a bit of context uh, on this book. Uh, I've been involved in a few book projects over the years. Uh, I think this is if, if I say so myself, different to uh, the other projects I've been involved in, in, in part, part because of the speed. We put this book together basically in four months and about two months later, it was published. Why was there a need for this urgency, for this speed? In part, we felt as we were writing the book, during the first lockdown, uh, the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, that this was a critical moment for Europe and the Roma community. And we wanted to produce a book that could be an instrument, a tool that would help Roma communities in this difficult time. Clearly, the COVID-19 pandemic has increased the, uh, uh, the prejudices against Roma communities. They have been scapegoated and targeted during this pandemic. They have been amongst some of the greatest losers uh, economically too. But it has to be remembered, there was a, a crisis already for the Roma. And that crisis had started in 2008 with the financial crisis, uh, a financial crisis that accentuated uh, the uh, extreme marginalization and exclusion that Roma were facing already. We know in Central Eastern Europe that with the transition to liberal democracies, the transition to a neoliberal society, the Roma had been amongst some of the greatest losers, experiencing high unemployment and greater levels of ghettoization. The financial crisis in 2008 made these problems worse. But not only that, uh, in parts of Europe, we saw an increase in populism, in uh, authoritarian politics. And it seemed to us during the time of, that we were writing the book that these problems were only getting worse. So it seemed an important time to make a contribution to the debate. Stefano described the book as a manifesto, and I, I think that is a fair description. Okay, we put the book together in four months, but this was based on years of discussion between Nidhi, Marius, uh, uh, and, and myself, and our co-workers and contributors. And feeding into that had been a number of conferences that we had organized, conferences where uh, community activists were, were highly evident and involved in the discussions. 
And we crystallize those debates and discussions into uh, something akin to uh, a manifesto. We call it an ideas tree. We didn't like the idea of calling it a manifesto. We wanted something fluid. We wanted something though that also represented the views of community members and, and activists. Um, basically, I think a key thing that we try and do in this book is revive the concept of social Europe. One of the reasons we felt we needed to say something now was because the European Union was formulating a new uh, framework on the Roma, what is called the uh, Strategic Roma Framework. We felt perhaps a book could shape that uh, new framework. And also the EU was uh, developing its uh, EU COVID recovery fund. And again, we felt this could be an opportunity to shape a, a, a redevelopment agenda that the EU was preparing. Um, basically, the concept of social Europe is an old one. It's been around since the late 70s and early 80s. It was a belief that the EU shouldn't just focus on the market. It should have a social dimension. And, and perhaps the high point of its influence was under the presidency uh, of the European Commission of Jacques Delors from roughly 85 to 95. The belief that the EU could play a more dynamic interventionist and redistributive role. As we know, uh, it was rather short lived. Uh, the neoliberal agenda of the EU gained ascendancy and somewhat marginalized the social dimension. We've tried to revive the politics of redistribution and intervention. We believe it is highly relevant for the Roma, but we try to make it relevant for the 21st century. We've tried to update uh, this concept to encompass uh, what, what is called critical Romani studies, new approaches to activism, knowledge production, uh, and, and the involvement and participation of Roma communities. That is why in the book, we say this new social Europe should uh, not be kind of 1970s top-down statist socialism. Yes, the state will have a hugely important role in the policies we want to see, but it must involve communities. There must be grassroots, bottom-up community development and involvement in decision-making and service delivery. We've also tried to make the concept of social Europe encompass more effectively diversity. In the 70s, the idea of social Europe was rather monocultural. There wasn't really much discussion uh, within the paradigm on, on diversity. What we want to see within social Europe is what could be described as a critical form of multiculturalism dialogue between majority and minority cultures where change can happen in both groups. Um, we believe uh, a more intercultural approach to diversity could be effective in challenging another manifestation of populism, namely culture war one which disparages and derides diversity policy. We do feel diversity policies have a role to play alongside economic uh, and, and political uh, redistribution and empowerment in policies to assist the Roma. So it's an important time, as Stefano said, the context of the book was written in a very dark and challenging period. We're not out of that yet, but I do believe 
the book contains what can be described as a pedagogy of hope. It's a book that maps out change and believes change is possible. And I think another important aspect of the book is that a majority of the contributors were from the Roma community, Roma academics, but also some non-Roma academics too. And I think that sets an important standard for future publications. Over the years, too many publications have perhaps not sufficiently paid enough attention to the Roma voice. I think we've made an important contribution and hopefully set an important standard and benchmark that others uh, will follow. Thank you. Thanks so much, Andrew. Um, Marius, then the floor is yours. If you have questions, as uh, Nando wrote in the chat, you can just write them down in the, in the yeah, write in the, in the chat and then I will read them later or if, yeah, that's it. Please, please, Marius. Hello, good afternoon uh, to everyone. I want to thank uh, Stefano for putting this uh, together. And I am really happy to be hosted by the um, uh, Institute of, uh, for Research and into Super Diversity. And it seems, uh, looking here on the screen, that the uh, Institute uh, succeeded at least for this meeting to, to reach uh, its uh, demanded uh, goal. Uh, we are here, uh, men, women, Roma, uh, non Roma, diverse group. Uh, yeah, the topic that uh, I would uh, try to to share with you uh, today, my my thoughts, uh, it's very high up uh, into a agenda, and uh, uh, my contribution into the book it was rather kind of a, of a intellectual reflection rather than uh, looking at uh, what is uh, the def the normative definition and institutional uh, lingua franca or the institutional uh, jargon uh, that it's uh, very uh, rapidly uh, uh, used by the national and especially international institution. Before to, to, to tackle the, the issue of anti-gypsism, I have to uh, make some um, uh, disclaimer because uh, there are uh, some critics and especially from uh, 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 academia, but also activists that the term anti-gypsism, it's uh, not accepted and is considered uh, uh, derogatory. And uh, in this regard, uh, I have to say that, yes, I do agree with terms proposed like uh, our colleague, Madame Matake from Harvard, who's proposing to use anti-Roma racism and other uh, types of uh, denomination. But in this presentation, I will uh, work with the raw material of the institutional uh, jargon and uh, I will keep uh, mentioning the uh, anti-Gypsies. So um, in our wonder to, to look at anti-Gypsies, uh, somehow we consider it the term uh, um, uh, as an intersectional uh, uh, problem. Uh, as uh, Andrew mentioned, the 2008, 2009 financial crisis actually still steer around some forms of manifestation of races specifically targeting Roma. And here uh, we are thinking of the events in uh, Italy of Berlusconi. Uh, I am thinking of the um, uh, crimes uh, uh, against Roma in Hungarian villages and all the term oils that was happening in an equal matter in a Western country as well in the Eastern country. Um, 
we also look at the uh, political crisis that the measure uh, taken in 2010, uh, like uh, uh, Sarkozy, that uh, actually uh, boosted up the what we have today, the national integration uh, Roma strategy and the political reaction of uh, uh, EU uh, as um, a matter of uh, quotation mark reparatory measure and what we had uh, the strategy from 2010-2020. Now our book uh, uh, also uh, was uh, last year when it was the preparation of a new uh, strategy of European uh, Union and we consider that some of our uh, reflections, some of our proposals would feed uh, both the uh, academic debate, but also uh, will uh, reach uh, in the hands uh, uh, of uh, policymakers. And uh, we consider that uh, anti-gypsism uh, uh, as an intersectional matter should be part of this book. But then why? Why? Because uh, we define or we, we took the, the exception of uh, racism as being defined of uh, an ideology and practice that produce a society in some systematical uh, uh, matter uh, that have less resources, power, security, and well-being than others. In our uh, analysis, I took the uh, exceptions of uh, Antias and uh, Yuval Davis, which argue that there is not a single form of races, but rather there is a, a plurality of races. And if we accept this, we also accept that there is a, a multiple uh, form of manifestation of anti-gypsism as well. Further on, in our analysis, we look at the fundamental rights agency, the report from 2018, where it was the first time where the dimension of anti-gypsies, it's uh, put it uh, into a report and actually uh, they try to uh, correlate the impact of uh, anti-gypsies on the policies. And for instance, in that report, the fundamental race, uh, uh, fundamental uh, rights agency uh, highlighted that between 2011 and 2016, the school segregation average in Europe increased from 5% to 10%. And this was attributed uh, in a, a certain level to anti gypsies a second aspect in our analysis, it's uh, to look at uh, uh, anti-gypsism as a form of uh, specific races, but from the less of its institutional uh, dimension. So it's not uh, the uh, discrimination and racism that it's happening in uh, everyday life, but it's uh, rather embedment and uh, institutional practices that somehow um, uh, look at the Roma uh, and uh, their policies uh, somehow affected in affects or affected in a direct manner uh, Roma. And here I'm thinking uh, uh, and inserted a couple of uh, uh, examples. For instance, in Hungary, after the 2009, 2010, 2011, crimes against uh, Roma, patrols that were um, uh, set up by Modior Garda, an extremist party. We sense it a little bit of transfer of uh, anti-Roma sentiments and anti-Roma political agenda uh, towards the new party at that time, Fides which embedded in, in, uh, in their things. And this is very easy to, to measure it because uh, uh, it seems that electorate of uh, Jobbik, 
uh, somehow has been uh, attracted by uh, the mainstream party. So this uh, uh, transfer from what it was the well-known uh, uh, enemy, uh, extreme right, it's somehow now diffuse and it's getting into the mainstream uh, uh, politics. Then uh, another uh, thing, we look at the longitudinal studies made by uh, Kas Mude, which actually it's demonstrating that both in Western Europe and in Eastern Europe, there is uh, uh, an increase um, participation, but also uh, political gains of the extreme right. But what is particular uh, to, to our analysis, it is that if in the countries like Romania, we didn't have uh, Romania Mare disappear from, uh, uh, from the scene, but for instance, the uh, physically, the former members of Romania, uh, Romania Mare somehow migrated into a socialist uh, party. So, uh, and uh, uh, it seems that some of the, the the things that were uh, naming and shaming, now they are embedded into a state politics. Uh, not uh, uh, the last, we analyze it from the um, uh, theoretical uh, point of view, uh, the historical uh, manifestation of, uh, of anti-Gypsyism. And actually we pair or we look specifically at uh, how uh, anti-Gypsies it manifested into a crisis situation. Uh, we call it crisis and uh, uh, irrationality. And during uh, uh, our write-up or final write-up, we were fitted with uh, specific uh, uh, state measures uh, of uh, anti-Gypsyism uh, uh, manifestation from, from instance in Bulgaria where the Roma community were managed by military forces and uh, the state uh, somehow criminalized Roma community as uh, disease spreaders. Uh, other examples in uh, Slovakia uh, and uh, where uh, the authorities under the umbrella of prioritizing the vulnerable Roma, they treated in a special manner uh, the Roma communities. And not the last, uh, the example uh, in my country of origin in Romania, where the police uh, somehow instituted uh, 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 specific measures and uh, imposed a lot of uh, violence against individuals and groups uh, of Roma. Uh, to try to conclude and to give um, space for debate, I think it's it worth uh, mentioning about what uh, is happening our days in the UK. Uh, and to my sense, it's a form of uh, a manifestation of uh, uh, anti-Gypsies if we take the two the two uh, dimension that I treated, the political one, uh, the institutional dimension, and uh, measures that are uh, targeting uh, directly uh, the Roma. And here I am thinking the debate that is happening now and the proposed law for police crime sentencing and court bills, which actually in the, in the fourth chapter it has specific measures that are targeting Roma uh, way of living and it's criminalizing the itinerancy uh, 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 way of, of living of uh, gypsy and uh, travelers and Roma with some things that might have uh, impact on the long run and uh, on their life. For instance, the, the new act it's stipulating seizing uh, a fine of two and a half thousand and also three months of imprisonment for allegedly uh, traveling around. And it's listing some very subjective um, uh, criteria to be judged how and whom will break the law in the way of uh, uh, traveling and in the sites for, for travelers and, uh, and gypsy. 
So uh, to conclude, our um, uh, analysis of uh, social Europe cannot be disentangled with the political Europe. And in our analysis uh, in the last 15 years, we've seen that these uh, uh, things uh, are very important. And uh, it's not just our um, uh, intellectual dreams to create a correlation, but we are supported also by uh, recognition of uh, European Commission uh, in the uh, last document for uh, new strategy for Roma integration, they try to have a normative definition. And recently, we got a definition from the European Council in 2021. However, we haven't succeeded to have an exhaustive definition of anti-gypsies, but we provided the reader with a couple of examples and uh, longitudinal and historical analysis in, uh, uh, and especially pointing out how anti-gypsies can be elevated in a time of crisis. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Marius. Um, so then, um, so if anti-gypsism is going mainstream somehow, no? what is happening on the side of um, Romani organization or Romani organizing? Nidhi, please. Thank you, Stefano, and thank you to everybody here in the University of Birmingham uh, IRIS program for inviting us. Um, I just, you know, there's so many uh, issues that have been raised um, on anti romani racism. And I think my contribution will focus on Romani agency and certainly uh, Romani movements, uh, which have been developed over the last several decades in particular. Uh, we can see the uh, evolution of Roma civil society. Um, and one of the reasons um, in the introduction I wanted Stefano to mention is the sort of discontents uh, around Romani organizing. Because after 30, 40 years, we have taken stock of what has worked in the movement and what are the gaps, you know, what are the lapses. And uh, the two contributions that I have worked on very closely, one is with uh, Magda Matake of Harvard University, and she's a well-known uh, Romani leader um, and activist and influencer, um, and she's also a scholar at Harvard. Um, she heads up the Roma program. So Magda and I, our chapter is really a retrospective because um, you know I was working in the 90s um, with the European Roma Rights Center. And certainly the European Roma Rights Center was using the advocacy model of strategic litigation, uh, you know, looking at uh, uh, gaps in the, in the law and whether it was, you know, cases of police brutality, um, whether it was uh, various cases of uh, segregation um, in education. So, so many of the strongest cases are the desegregation cases which Magda herself worked on at the ground level in Romania with Romani Cris. And uh, those of you who have been following the Roma movement will be familiar with organizations like Romani Cris who have worked with the international organizations uh, like uh, you know, Amnesty, uh, Human Rights Watch, and of course, European Roma Rights Center, which is the premier uh, international sort of litigation organization. Um, the, the thing that I think the chapter really highlights with Magda is um, what are the paths forward? Um, where have we reached, you know, uh, with the Roma civil society and what are the paths forward? So I would just like to uh, read a couple of passages directly from the book, which kind of summarize, uh, you know, what Magda and I uh, were saying. And these are actually Magda's words. Perhaps in the past few years, we have seen some seeds of hope in the representation of Roma in a few governments, parliaments, and intergovernmental organizations. So that's the other part of the puzzle, is to what extent Romani uh, interlocutors themselves have come to positions of power within government or intergovernmental organizations. And here we're talking, of course, 
a member of European Parliament. We are also going back and talking a little bit about the OSCE, the uh, you know contact point for Roma and Sinti, um, as well as Council of Europe. You know uh, the Roma delegations that have come before the Council of Europe. Um, so there is definitely a very um, visible uh, Romani presence in many of these halls. Um, so certainly uh, our epilogue, as you know, was um, written by uh, MEP Romeo France. And I think he gives a very eloquent um, exposition of why, uh, you know, the exclusion of Roma. And, and let's be very clear, we are talking about anti romani racism which underpins structural inequality of Roma, right? This is at the core of Romani exclusion uh, for centuries, actually. And um, certainly, Romeo Franz, I think, very eloquently highlights this issue. Um, so, yeah, let me finish this uh, passage I was reading. Um, but as a people, and this is Magda speaking, I would say we are still lagging behind in terms of representation, leadership, and power. We must be vocal in demanding our place at the table. In the case of other marginalized groups, their leaders and scholars would certainly not stay silent if someone organizes public fora on their oppression. And there isn't enough representation from their particular group. I think in the case of Roma, Gage, which is non-Roma, continue to discount us we continue to see non-Roma represent us and speak on behalf of or about us. And even though it may not be the same as the 1990s, the power differential is still there. Often we don't see a conscious and intentional effort to rectify this. So this also leads us, we have a very uh, interesting discussion about allyship. Uh, how do non-Roma organizations, how do non-Roma academics and interlocutors uh, how can uh, we be allies, you know? And, and that's the, the real question, I think, is that the, the, the idea of Romani organizing, uh, according to Magda and according to myself as well, has not really been approached um, in the right way. In other words, when you read the, this chapter further, uh, we use a concept which Magda has uh, highlighted, which is the uh, guns um, concept uh, and Gans, of course, was a, uh, a very prominent uh, social um, organizer uh, in America. Um, he had worked with uh, Cesar Chavez of the uh, United Farm Workers, um, and he had actually been on the ground uh, in California. And so he had taken many of these tactics and strategies um, and. Um, what Magda is saying is that these tactics and strategies can be applied um, at the local level with Romani community organizing, uh, building up the resources, um, sort of um, enhancing the skills of, of Romani uh, uh, community members, um, and, and really harnessing also the power uh, of the state. Okay, so, so how, how do you, so this is the dilemma, this is the conundrum for Romani organizing is how do you harness the local level skills, keeping the priorities of the community you know, at, the, at the forefront, at the same time, harnessing uh, the resources of the state, okay, as well as the donor community. And this is where we went back and forth with Magda about the impact of the donor-driven agenda and how often that's a pitfall in Romani organizing. And this is something we have learned lessons from the past 20 years about. Now we come to a point where Roma uh, organizers, uh, sorry, Roma organizations uh, often do not have access to the kind of funding that they had, let's say, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. So again, it's a question of how do you build the resources? And I think uh, what Gans is arguing is that those resources can actually come from within the community because often the community itself has been ignored and neglected, the power within the community. So this is, we, we cover this, you know, uh, a little uh, uh, in depth in the, in the chapter. Um, <clears throat> so the other point I do want to raise is, um, this is something we discussed in the uh, chapter with Angela Kotsi. Um, who's a professor at Central European University. Many of you know her work. Many of you are familiar 
with the Romney Studies program and critical Romney Studies at the CU. And in that chapter, we talk about Romani um, uh, women's voice and, and I should say Romani feminism um, and how the intersectional approach is very central to that. And, and that, uh, the reason that, that that has been, I guess, ignored uh, for so long is because Romani women and their needs and their priorities have been ignored for so long. And this is uh, something, again, um, uh, you talked, uh, Stefano, about a manifesto. And I think the chapter with Angela is perhaps the strongest uh, manifestation of the manifesto. Um, and certainly, um, I, when you read the chapter, um, we try to look at a lot of the structural issues behind Romani exclusion and how can Romani feminist intersectionality and, and feminist epistemology uh, address that? You know, this is the, the central uh, thesis. And, and certainly, Angela and I, we have delved, you know, we've been working together <laughs> for almost, I don't know, 15, 20 years. Um, and um, we have delved into post-colonial theory, post-colonial epistemology, and its application to the situation of Roma. And again, I would like to read very briefly from one of the passages in uh, the chapter with Angela as well. And uh, the, the, the name of this chapter is also very powerful, I think. When they enter, we all enter. Okay. And envisioning a new social Europe from a Romani feminist perspective. So they actually refers to uh, marginalized Romani women, by the way. Um, okay. So I'm going to read you a quick passage, which I think kind of epitomizes. Yeah. And this actually goes to the heart of the matter. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and this is kind of a summary of that chapter also. This piece offered a critical theoretical contribution that reimagines a radically transformed social Europe by using the language and insights of Romani feminists who challenge the intersected gendered, racial, and class violence, not as merely coincidental, but rather as a systemic condition of neoliberal racial capitalism. If we want to re-envision Europe, neither the feminist nor the anti-racist Romney movements can afford to ignore the intersectional lived experiences of the vast majority of Romani women who are in a continuous life and death struggle for survival and emancipation. So again, uh, often, um, we do not hear that silenced Romani women's voice, you know, the, the subalterns voice. And that's really what we wanted to highlight in this chapter and how this would be the path forward. Once that voice is recognized, we then create the basis for what we call intersectional solidarity, which is also with many different groups in the Romani community, but also outside the community. And I talked about allyship. So here, um, you know, we with Ma, in Mada's chapter, we talked about solidarity with other oppressed groups like Dalits, Dalit community of, of India and Pakistan. Um, we also talked about African American uh, solidarity in America, in, in North America, um, and LGBTQI uh, plus uh, solidarity. So this this is the kind of um, intersectional solidarity which would then become the basis for um, a movement. I think which will show us, you know, pave the, the path forward within a sort of broader concept of social Europe. So um, I think I've just come full circle here on that. And we're probably also running out of time, uh, but I do wanna mention that at the tail end of the book, we were very much influenced by the Black Lives Matter movement, okay? And what was happening, the turmoil, the social turmoil that was happening in the US at the time, um, it had a deep impact on many Romney intellectuals. Um, and uh, we can definitely discuss that further uh, in the Q&A. But uh, once again, um, I do want to mention uh, the really amazing uh, Romney contributors uh, in this book. And I hope everyone has a chance to read it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. So we already have a um, question in the chat. I suggest since we are 
a group of a small group of 34 people right now i suggest uh, that you raise the hand or you we use the the emoticons there like the party emoticon if you want to 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 ask a question and then you can just use your voice <laughs> um I don't know if um, uh, Sarli, you want to read your. Do you want to to make to put to ask your question? But you have to unmute yourself. No. I think um, we can just go ahead and and yeah. I think. I Andrew is reading it, and it's it's really an interesting one, which I have asked Andrew about the UK, actually. Okay, so the the question everyone can read it, or I can I can read it with my with my uh, Italian accent. So now the UK has left the EU. Um, how do we shape the agenda in the UK? Uh, I would suggest that for most uh, people in the UK, gypsies and travelers is more synonymous with Irish travelers and travelers who have adopted the, that lifestyle because of reasons apart from ethnicity. Is there a crossover of types of exclusion and systemic sufficient to speak about all gypsies in the UK as having a commonality of need? Or should progress towards the inclusion of different kinds of travelers be always considered separately for different groups? And uh, yeah, this is a question that maybe also I've been working with Tina on this uh, you know, relation between <clears throat> with Tina Magazzini, who is here today, the new and the old Roma or the, which I mean, somehow. So, um, okay. So I don't know who wants to, 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 to answer the question, maybe Andrew. I, I, I can start off by saying a few comments. Before I was an academic, I was a policy officer for gypsy traveler NGOs in the UK um, from 2006 to 10. I was the policy officer for what's now called the travel movement. Then it was the Irish travel movement. And before that, I was the policy worker for the gypsy traveler law reform coalition and umbrella group of gypsy traveler groups in the UK. So this, this is very much a, a question that we thought about a lot. One of the things that we were very pleased with in our campaign, and this was something that came from the community, is that we got different traveler groups to work together. In our campaigns, we had Romany gypsies, Irish travelers, new travelers, and Roma started to get involved, and I think Roma are now heavily involved in campaign work of organisations like the NGO Friends, Families and Travellers. Within these communities, actually, there is a great deal of variation. Yes, some have a nomadic lifestyle, some live in caravans, but actually many uh, are living in sedentary accommodation in housing. Um, there is a wide variety of uh, experiences in terms of marginalization. Um, I think it's important that these different groups work together because the, the old you know, saying, strength in numbers, unity is strength. Uh, it has added strength to the campaigns for them to come together. But also I think it's facilitated forms of intersectionality. Once the groups are able to work with groups put under this Gypsy Roma Traveller umbrella, it became easier then to work with other ethnic groups such as the Bangladeshi, the and, uh, and groups like the LGBTQ community. And I, I saw these steps being taken, uh, which I felt was very productive. In terms of Europe, um, I would say that it's in the best interests of Gypsy Roma travelers to campaign for the UK's re-entry into the European Union. Uh, I think the European Union uh, and what it represents offers something which is in the best interests of these communities. 
Thanks, Andrew. Nando, you want to, did you raise your hand? Um, I have a, a couple of questions. One a follow up on Andrew's point. Uh, and, uh, and I think that the question around Brexit and UK is actually is, more, is also more structural from a social demographic point of view, in a sense, the diversification of, of uh, Romani communities in, in UK is partly the result of the membership of the European Union, you know, the freedom of movement, the mobility. We also know very well that the Roma people are going to be probably the first that will not be allowed to come into the UK uh, once the, the new immigration system come in place. So this is, may also create a new reality also in terms of activism and alliances, I think, that we need to think about. Because I, I remember when uh, you know, I was involved in the Council of Europe at the beginning of the 2000s, there was always this conversation about, between the, the Irish travelers complaining about them having to use the Roma label as an imposed one or something like that. So it's quite nice to see, uh, to think about the future. And the other one is maybe for Marius around uh, um, the, the tension between um, uh, anti-racism as, as a social movement and anti-black racism uh, as a social movement, anti-Romani racism as a social movement. Or, uh, my concern maybe is how uh, identity politics percolates within uh, also basically the fragmentation of the fight against racism. You know, if, we, if everyone has got their, their own racism to fight, it's also very hard to create alliances. And I was wondering how within the, the Romani movement, the, the issues of alliances uh, is built. This is one of the reasons why I like the book, the idea of the new social Europe as a, an umbrella that can bring in alliances. So. Uh, shall I, Mr. Uh, President? Please, please. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank Pleasure. you very much for, uh, for your question. Indeed, uh, actually, um, yes, we, in our uh, um, uh, approach, we put uh, the social Europe as uh, an umbrella term that will uh, invite uh, for uh, and things, but in my uh, chapter, but also during my uh, uh, longitudinal analysis, for instance, uh, in the case of uh, Hungary, uh, there are two aspects of anti-Gypsyism, which uh, in, uh, in, in my intervention, I didn't uh, tackle it. One, it's that they are recurrent. So uh, in my analysis, I looked at, uh, um, interwar period and also I uh, even cited and look at uh, the, the sign that Karl Polanyi in his uh, seminal book, uh, 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 The Great Transformation, gave as a, um, a triggers, as a, a proxies of what it means, uh, kind of a populism and uh, uh, rise of uh, extreme right. And, Actually, this was uh, the way how we, we look that in a time of a crisis, the anti-Gypsies, it's actually recurrent and it has some specific uh, form of manifestation uh, around or post-crisis uh, uh, situation. Uh, another uh, aspect, it is exactly this, uh, what you, you put it, that sometimes the politics of identity it's exactly the mechanism of uh, otherness, yeah? When the, uh, this, uh, uh, the, when the Roma are, are portrayed as, uh, as uh, um, scapegoating or what uh, Cohen uh, uh, called the, the moral panic, yeah? Uh, but this is uh, uh, even more to me. Uh, and this is a sign for solidarity. And I will go back to my, uh, analysis on Hungary. So historically, it was 2008, 2009, 2010, when Roma have been killed, civil society, academics, and others, they were mute. Then it was 2010, 2012, when Jobbik put it on the public agenda, the blood, the traces of, in the blood of Jewishness. Academics, politicians, civil society, they were mute. Couple of years later, 
the government continued and started to attack freedom of expression, academic freedom, et cetera, et cetera. And when reached the so-called powerful layers of a society, the middle class, upper class, and intellectuals, they realize that the crisis is too big to be stopped. So the ignorance and the signal of anti-Gypsyism is a sign that today it's Roma, but tomorrow it might be Jewish, uh, day after it might be intellectuals, and at the end of, uh, of the story, it might be a disaster. And this is, this is historically uh, documented, but we have a, a very interesting uh, uh, approach in Hungary when the, the salami slice uh, practice started with Roma and actually reached uh, the, the uh, very, very interesting uh, layer of, uh, of Hungarian society. So uh, uh, to conclude, indeed for us, uh, intersectional approach uh, contribution of Angela and Nidi also invited for solidarity and cohesion among the, the discriminated or vulnerable groups. But anti-Gypsy sometimes it might be the proxy indicators that a society it might get wrong. And to, to conclude it, it is the same here in, uh, in the UK. Think that uh, Roma were uh, portrayed during the Brexit campaign uh, in a way of, uh, or in a, in a type of uh, welfare chauvinism, uh, saying, yes, they are coming, they will get uh, all our benefits, all our jobs, they will litter our, uh, and they continue now, they have a specific targeted legislation against Roma. Maybe if this is not reacted now, we don't know who will be next. So in this logic of recurrence and uh, reaction of all the oppressed group, uh, it's uh, one of the, the signals uh, that I believe, and uh, it, it, the history is here uh, next to us. We just have to open uh, our eyes, so we shouldn't go too far back. Thank you. Thanks. Um, are there some questions? It's already four here in the UK. Maybe we can uh, try to answer a couple of questions more. Stefano? I, can I just uh, pick up the string about the UK? The voice is like a microphone. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so no, I was just going to say that I had some thoughts also on Nando's statement about, you know, the, the different types of uh, communities in the, you know, Roma umbrella, let's say. And I think the East European Roma who have settled um, in the UK, let's say over the last 10, 15, 20 years or more, um, I think that, you know, their position is, you know, relatively secure. I, I, I do understand that the, the new immigrants coming in will face uh, some new exclusionary, you know, mechanisms from the state, from, from the British state. But I think that overall, um, what will be interesting are the alliances, the trans, uh, or you know, the the, the continental alliances uh, between the continental uh, uh, Roma and then the ones in the UK settled in the UK, and I think that the cooperation, the the, the communication channels, the bridges, they're already there, um, and then just geographically speaking, even if the regime is different in terms of visa regime, uh, passports, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, you know, you still have Eurostar, you still have many mechanisms, um, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm still relatively hopeful, uh, even what Andrew said earlier, that there might be some kind of a, uh, a detente or compromise so that that, the, that flow is not just completely, uh, you know, shut down. I, I, I think that those linkages will, will continue. I'm, I'm kind of hopeful for that. And, and so the solidarity in a way with continental Roma from UK side will will also you know be there. So. Okay, so I I also I have maybe a, a last question if anyone else if there are no further questions. Um, so because of research I have been conducting in Spain, I am really thrilled by the notion of intersectional solidarity, which is something that Marius and Nidi and uh, 
I think that in the two dialogical uh, last chapters is it emerged and also in Marius chapter and um, so I'm sort of uh, thrilled interested and uh, but uh, it, it still remains a vague or a vague concept to me and um, uh, as far as I understand is is a, a so I don't know if it is like a is desiderable um, intersectional so if, if intersectional solidarity means um, um, ra racialize groups discriminate discriminated minorities trying to um, uh, come together and uh, and uh, based on that kind of shared experience of uh, uh, racism. Uh, learn from each others and uh, and also find a safe space where to express and where to like grow up as a as a, um, uh, as, a as a movement with these like also transnational bridges and um, okay I mean I don't know I, I know I understand that this is like one description but my question is okay I have the feeling that maybe this may work for the elites in a certain way uh, but then if we look at the local level, I think there are other um, intersectional alliances and encounters that uh, could be uh, more significant with, with uh, uh, what we can call like colorblind activism somehow, or as uh, An Angela Koch uh, uh, said, like one, one issue social movement, she used this term, no? Because in Spain have been observing um, uh, Romanian Roma homeless entering an anti in um, um, anti the anti joining the anti eviction movement, mm -hmm. uh, and have been reading. There are many other experiences um, in Europe uh, and research on this topic, and I thought that maybe this is also a, a type of intersectional uh, alliance that is not um, between um, uh, racialized groups, but is between uh, um, groups. Uh, with different backgrounds, uh, statuses that, in any case, that that shared similar um, oppression, um, like trajectories of oppression, maybe homelessness, maybe gender violence, and so on. So I was wondering if this concept can can be uh, not used also to as a as a lens to look at these experiences. And what do you think about? It? Because at the local level is where things happen. <laughs> You know, yeah, in the district. Absolutely. So, uh, um, Marius, do you want to address that? Because I, I'll just say one small comment. So, the idea of uh, intersectional solidarity also comes from the Canadian experience, which is also highlighted in the book. In Canada, you know, we have a very large uh, First Nations community, the Indigenous community of Canada. And so, the Roma activists, for example, in Quebec, um, uh, they have formed some alliances. Um, I'm particularly thinking about uh, Lela Savage's work. Your audio is uh, gone, Niti. We don't listen to you anymore. Marius? Yeah, uh, uh, do you hear me? Stefano, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think it's a it's a very important uh, thing. And actually, uh, before to to answer your your question, I wanted to say that uh, Andrew Ryder just la uh, launched last uh, uh, late last year a book called Britain and uh, Europe at the Crossroad: The Politics Analysis. Uh, uh, it's on Brexit, the, the book. So uh, he's very humble, not saying about this, but actually he analyzes uh, 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 this uh, uh, very in deep. But to answer your question indeed uh, about the elitism versus bottom up or the, the crowd project, Europe per se, uh, it's uh, built it as a top uh, down uh, 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 mechanism and also it's a, it's a project and emulation of an elitist approach. If you want, uh, uh, it's, it's also what Max Weber uh, uh, put it uh, in his uh, 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 write-up, the bureaucratic uh, uh, institution, yeah? So this is one and indeed uh, uh, here it's also related with, uh, with the 
the uh, first question that was raised uh, in written and, and you, you read it. Uh, indeed, uh, 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 EU might not solve the problem. They don't, the, the subsidiarity mechanism and uh, impact uh, might not reach the last village of Bulgaria. But what is important, it is that they might still uh, set up the agenda, uh, a budget, and also can, if we use the language of a, a, a policy development, so they are the policy initiators back up with some budget with all the sins that they have, that they cannot impact and they cannot have a, a kind of a, uh, to, to impose and to, to follow the, the, the process and to distribute the, the resources uh, in such a manner, it, it's, uh, it will be a, a lot of uh, time, the buffer where the crisis will, will happen. What EU it's uh, 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 envision as a bureaucratic apparat and what the, the member states will uh, even obey. Uh, sorry for my uh, uh, non-academic uh, words, uh, obey or uh, put into a practice but still, uh, to my sense, EU remain a very important mechanism uh, for policy agenda, even for the UK, because sometimes the states, they might learn from imitation yeah, in the policy development. And actually, during my practice, I experienced, for instance, how a scholarship program that functioned well in, uh, in a former Yugoslav uh, space, the other uh, uh, state uh, immediately took it over. So to me, indeed, it might be a, a question of inefficiency of EU at the uh, bottom strata of the society, but for intellectual debate and uh, public policy agenda and uh, uh, politics of, uh, of Europe, it remains a very important uh, institution and body. For Roma too, so to, to conclude. Well, um, thanks so much, everyone. I think we have to finish it here. Uh, it was a pleasure. For those who didn't read the book, I suggest to read, <laughs> read it, and um, <laughs> read it. <laughs> and. Um, Again, on the website, on the link that uh, Nidhi shared, uh, there is a um, 20% uh, discount on the paperback, paperback edition. And um, I think what we will do in the future is to have a look to see what happened with the new uh, Roma strategy framework. That this year, I mean, this year, this decade is called for equality, inclusion, and participation. It's no more a national Roma integration strategy, no? And I didn't have the chance to read the, um, the documents, and um, and uh, but I think it's something we can um, maybe make a follow up uh, in the future, and uh, that's it. Okay, so thanks so much again. Thank you. And, Thank uh, you. Hope to see you in the in the reality at a certain point. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Nando. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Stefano. you very much. Thank it's you. Been well. great to you. Bye bye. Take care. Thank bye. you, Stefano. Bye. Okay. Bye.